Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by AMS Media. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simi. I hope you're all keeping safe. I hope you're all keeping well. I hope you've all had a fantastic Easter and enjoying what's left of this bank holiday Monday. Um, it's another episode of Arsenal Gold and my guest for this edition was another very special guest. He's been on the podcast before, as I'm sure most of you will know, um, but he is an Arsenal legend. And I love talking to Arsenal legends and I can't get enough of it. Um, so I invited him back and kindly he took some time out of his day uh, at the back end of last week to join me for this edition, especially for you guys. We'll be talking through some of his greatest memories and we'll be talking uh, about some of the, the current talking points, I guess, around the club at the moment as well. So we'll be getting his take uh, on some of the young players and, and various other bits and pieces. Proud to introduce you to Nigel Winterberg. Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, Nigel Winterburn. How are you doing, my friend? Yeah, very good, thank you. Good, good. How are you coping, Nigel, without any football? I know, obviously, that the situation isn't great and, you know, it is what it is and we have to be careful and it's absolutely the right thing that football's been suspended. But how are you coping? How are you feeling your time at the minute? Well, I've got plenty to do, if I'm honest with you. Um, just before Christmas, we moved into a new property. I'm very, very lucky. Um, we've got a nice garden with a bit of paddock uh, attached to the bottom of it. And I don't think people will know, but um, as a family, we've got a few horses. So um, Brilliant. I'm hoping to get, I've been sorting the paddock out and trying to get, so we enable us to get at least a couple of the horses back. Um, for the uh, for next summer, not this summer coming, but for next summer. So, um, and with it being so wet and a new garden, we haven't been able to get onto it. So the last couple of weeks, with uh, the sun coming out, uh, has been has been okay for us. Um, but it's like, you know, I feel so lucky compared to a lot of people because I think I'd be going a bit stir crazy if I was in a one bedroom flat and was told that I couldn't really go out. So um, I'm just trying to adhere to, to the, you know, to the laws and what we're being told by the government. Um, and, and we just got to get on with it. Yep. I'm missing the football, particularly coming to the Emirates and mixing with all the guests with the, you know, with the work that I was doing on the corporate side, but that's, you know, only a small part of uh, what needs to happen. We need to, we're losing lives. We need to, we reduce that drastically and then eventually we will get back to normal absolutely it is a sacrifice but it's a sacrifice that's well worth it at the minute particularly when you're talking about the health of others and uh, so great to hear that you're, you're a diy man as well not just a talented footballer but a diy i didn't man say well. i was a di i didn't say i was a diy man <laughs> i just i just said I'm, I, I i'm you know i'm just doing it myself i'm just i've always had a go but I mean, this is something you know. It's yeah, I've been rotivating a paddock and grass seeding, and just hoping that uh, and praying every single day that I walk out there that uh, the grass is going to start coming through eventually, and then it means I will have succeeded. But uh, you know, listen, it's it's nothing compared to what's been going on, and uh, you know that's the really important thing that the message out there is to follow the follow the uh, advice of the government because. We don't know if we are carriers without any symptoms. Yeah. Uh, we simply, you know, one death is one too many in my eyes. Agreed. Completely agree. Nigel, let's talk about some of your, your greatest Arsenal memories. And I'm sure there were plenty to choose from. And I, I, I don't envy you in having the task of narrowing this down um, to th your three greatest memories in an Arsenal shirt. Um, take me through the first one. Tell me about it, what it meant to you and uh, how you look back on it. Well, I, I, the first one, I think most people will probably say, oh, he would have picked that anyway. It was 89 at Anfield. Um, how could it not be the first one, really? Um, for me, the, you know, the, the greatest ever game of football to decide a title in quite surreal circumstances, uh, really, because we were in control of winning the the title and then we started to falter a little bit we had the Hillsborough um, disaster where so many people lost their lives the league was uh, suspended I think it was for a couple of weeks 
and then obviously our game against Liverpool, which I don't think many people thought about at the time, would come down to deciding the league title and the way those games unfolded between each club's uh, and the lead up to the final game where, let's be fair, everybody saw that Liverpool would be, be, be crowned champions and it would be a, a fitting end to the season. But uh, Did you feel that they, a, did, did you feel like that, Nigel? Did you go into that game with confidence or did you, was you kind of, because I guess everybody was talking about how Liverpool, you know, were in the driving seat and that Liverpool were going to win the title. And I know in hindsight, a lot of people have said that we're in the Arsenal camp at the time. You know, we believed it. Did you genuinely believe it that you, you had a great yeah, chance? Yeah, I, 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 my philosophy on when I stepped out onto the pitch was that my belief individually and hopefully collectively as a team um, was that we would win every game. I didn't care who we played against. I respected some fantastic teams that we played against. But my belief was that every time we went out, we were going to win. Uh, and that's how I that's how I played every, every single game. So I believed we could win. I knew it was going to be, you know, a unbelievable task to beat a very, very good Liverpool team, particularly at, at Anfield on what was going to be an, uh, an emotional night. But you have to you simply have to believe. Yeah. Um, you know, if you don't, particularly even go, if going to Anfield, you're just, you're just going to get, you know, absolutely walloped. So we, you know, people do say we had nothing to lose, but the game plan that we, the way that we set the game up just unfolded perfectly. Um, and I suppose, the you know, Mickey's goal right at the end just didn't give Liverpool any any time to uh, to react but uh, it was a bit close wasn't it <laughs> yeah <laughs> just a little bit <laughs> just a little bit no it's, it's an incredible night and and you know I, I wasn't around at that time I don't remember it per se but I have watched it back countless times I've watched obviously the, the documentary about it um, and it is one of the great nights in Arsenal's history if not the greatest um, and you must be extremely proud to have taken part in that yeah, I think so because we've talked about you know all the things that happened. We should have should have won the title two or three games before, um, and then I remember listening to uh, the Liverpool game when they played West Ham, uh, and I had to on the radio and I had to switch that game off because as the goals were going in, I'm thinking the start of the game if Liverpool win, which we expected them to do. Um, we're going to have to go to Anfield and win. And then as those goals kept going in, the realisation that it was two. And I'm thinking if they score again, three is just not realistic. Yeah. Um, so um, I turned I turned that off and just waited for the result to come through at the end of the game. <laughs> uh, and then the realisation that we had to win by two clear goals. I think taking the flowers out, before you know, before the game, and giving them out to uh, the Liverpool supporters, I think at the end of that game gave us uh, a lot of the, the Liverpool supporters gave us a lot of respect for what we did. Uh, and for me, I mean, just forgetting about the, the the game itself, just I've never seen a team presented uh, with a trophy before, and that stadium was absolutely full, and uh, you know. Um, the, the, I do just remember that obviously the Arsenal uh, supporters were delirious, but the appreciation we got from from the Liverpool supporters, I will never ever forget that. Yeah, Kevin Campbell spoke about that as well on on one of our previous episodes, where he said that they came into the changing room after and they were very graceful in the defeat, and and that's always great to hear, isn't it? Because as painful as it would have been for them, it is a sport, and and they showed great sportsmanship, um, not just the fans, but the players and the staff involved with Liverpool as well. So that's yeah, and, and it, yeah, yeah, and it was nice to have their champagne as well. It, it, it tasted <laughs> even better. <laughs> Could only imagine. I could only imagine. <laughs> Nigel, take me on to number two. So your next uh, greatest Arsenal memory. Uh, well, it's the uh, Cup Winners' Cup final, isn't it? In '94. I mean, massive underdogs again. Um, and I think, really, for me, when you look through 
with George, we were in you know the team in '89 when we won the league, and then again in '91, we were the team that was going to challenge uh, Manchester United. It was such a fantastic team through that period, and then I don't know if we lost our way a little bit in terms of consistency after that in the league, but it almost felt as if we came became a bit of a, a cup team. And then, obviously, the 93, the uh, the, the uh, FA Cup and the League Cup double, we you know, we followed that up with the, the 94 game. But I think the memories for me from that were really from not just the final itself, but from the quarter-final, semi-final, and then the, the final. And we... We played Torino in the quarterfinals, who were a very, very good team at the time. PSG, who were a fantastic team in the semi final. And then obviously uh, uh, Palmer in the final, who were defending champions. But I mean, only to concede one goal in, in really in five games against that level of opposition just showed um, the level of performance and the, the commitment we were at at that period of time. And it was really a, a backs against the wall job. I mean, Brolin, Esprilla, and Zola, obviously the three players that spring to mind because they've been over and played in, in the English leagues. Um, and they were a fantastic team at the time. We were a little bit uh, depleted in terms of uh, numbers as well and injuries. But what a performance it was after, you know, Allen's. Alan Smith's goal, we just completely stuffed them out. Yeah, they had some chances, but you know the work that the the team put in under you know under George at that time was just 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 incredible. And uh, what a night it was! It was you know it was a true underdog sort of battling qualities um, with a with a superb finish from from Smudger. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, it was, an, it was it was an incredible night, and we were so far uh, the underdogs. It, it was incredible, just in a, a you know, in a, a in a one-off game. Brilliant stuff. And Nigel, you mentioned there that you thought that at that time Arsenal became a little bit of a cup team, and that is a a phrase that we do hear in football quite a bit. We hear about teams, you know, maybe being better suited to cup competitions. What is it that's different sort of from a player's mentality point of view that, that differentiates between a cup team and a, and a team that's in the league, that's successful in the league? I guess when you're going out on the pitch, the objective is the same every week, isn't it? So why do you think that is? I just feel we'd had, you know, I mean, I joined in, in uh, with George in, in 87. We'd had, uh, and he'd put, Really, he'd put you know he he put a new team together. He'd he'd promoted um, some of the uh, youth team players. You know the players, the young players that had been there for a while. Um, he'd brought in you know the likes of Lee Dixon, uh, Steve Bowles, uh, myself, uh, um, and then he'd got rid of really his established players. And I think he got rid of the players that he thought wouldn't want to work with him and the way that he wanted to, the way that he wanted to play. Um, so it was a period where we, if you like, we came together very, very quickly. We won, a t well, as we talked about, won the titles in 89 and 91. But everyone will tell you that trying to defend a title is so, so hard. And I think just along the way, we maybe lost a little bit of consistency the following season and then we have to come again. Um, and then all of a sudden we sort of became a bit more inconsistent. But the Cups, we just seemed to click and the, you know, the you know, one-legged games or the two-legged games, we just seemed to have a knack of knowing how to, to manage those manage those games and uh, I can't really sort of put anything down to what is that reason I just think it was the consistency in the leagues that we couldn't quite get back up to yeah. in periods but as a cup team you know in one-off games we were right there and we were we were sort of bang at it and we were you know we were spot on for most of those games as you have to be when you get into the 
later stages of cup competitions, you you do come up against good teams. Agreed, and and you're absolutely right to to mention game management because I think that is key, um, particularly in cup competitions. Where I guess if you make a mistake, you don't have another thirty seven games to put it right. Or, you know, it is literally about game management, and those who are superior at that, George Graham being an absolute specialist in that, um, you know, obviously that that stands you in good stead. Let's move on to number three, um, and I'm I'm pretty sure I can guess what this one is. Um, but well, go ahead. I, 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 yeah, I mean it's the '98 league title, but I'll just chuck in the FA Cup with it because to achieve a double, uh, I think you you know you hear of teams that have done it uh, and players talking about it. But for me, it was an absolute dream to um, to secure that domestic uh, double. But particularly with Arsene Wenger coming in. The 98 team that he put together, I I say, talent-wide, was probably the best team that I'd um, played in. The freedom that Arsene Wenger gave us to go and play, just trusted the back four to be able to organise itself and the players in front of them. But then he brought that creative midfield and uh, expansive play going forward. With Overmars coming into the to the team as well out wide on my my side, and it was just it was just such a exciting period for me coming towards I suppose the late later years of my career um, to 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 do that double um, and the way that season really developed was we started really strongly, we then wobbled, um, but just after Christmas was. The key when we got it all back together, uh, and I think we went from Boxing Day. You'll have to check, but I think it was about 18 games unbeaten until we won the title. Um, I don't know how many games in a row we didn't concede a goal. There's quite a few, um, but the pivotal game along the way was that Man United game away from home. Wow, what a lift that gave us after Mark had scored. Yep, and Elka and Flick on over Mars with a finish. <laughs> yeah, but I think that really that gives you when you win away at a big team, going they're going for the uh, the title. It gives you such a lift, and it just dents their confidence a little bit. Uh, and then we, as I say to you, we were on such a terrific run. But I think that was the moment when the realization was there that it was there for us to take. And as I say, on many many occasions you got to step across the line and get your hands on it. Uh, and we had a team that was, was good enough to do that. And uh, as I just said to you, that, that team for me was such an exciting team to play. And it was, it was a fantastic period to, 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 to be at the club. And slightly just the way that the, the uh, formation and the, 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 the thoughts of Arsene Wenger was changing the club. Um, it was it was such an honour to be there at that period of time. Absolutely, and for me, that is a season that is always very close to my heart because it was probably the first one that I remember very well, and that I was attending games. I was seven years old at the time, and it was kind of my first experiences of, of football and what made me fall in love with the game and Arsenal of course um, and it was a really really special season and I think you're absolutely right the victories uh, over Manchester United there was of course the 3-2 win at Highbury which I remember David Platt uh, with the winning with the goal yeah, with the header yeah. that's yeah. it after they'd come from two goals down so you know th- those games will live long in the memory and I'm not surprised that you've picked this one in the slightest because it's history um, and as you say it signified I guess the start of some real great times under Arsene Wenger didn't it? Yes it did but I mean the, the three games that I really why I picked those three games was you know obviously the, the, for me uh, joining Arsenal with George Graham uh, and and going on to, to win league titles and then becoming a little bit of a uh, of a of a cup team with uh, the, you know the, the, the cup winners cup final uh, being the pinnacle and then the changeover if you like onto Arsene Wenger and the double within his first full season um, and for me just watching the way that he dev- after even after I'd retired watched the way that uh, the team just well I left first and then retired but watching the team develop 
uh, and, and, and move forward was such an incredible period at the football club. As I've always said on many, many occasions, um, for an Arsenal supporter, it must have been in absolute dreamland for for a period of time because it was a sensational uh, period for, uh, for Arsene Wenger and, and the teams that he managed. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more, Nigel. Um, wanted to get your thoughts on a couple of uh, current topics. Um, and the first one that I want to get your opinions on is, is Bukayo Saka, of course, a young man who's broken into the Arsenal team, um, is being asked at the moment to play in a position that is in his natural position. We, we know that growing up through the ranks, he's been a winger. He's then slotted into left back. For me, he's taken the opportunity with both hands and he's showed what he can do and how mature he is, etc. What do you make of Bukayo Saka at left back? Do you think he's got a future playing there as somebody who obviously mastered the role? Do you see him having the qualities required to, to do that in the longer term? Well, I, th- I think he has. I mean, it's a completely different role, a fullback role to when I first started. But I think the that role suits him really well listen I don't know whether you know he wants to go and be uh, a, 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 a you know a, a wide left player a winger in, in the future I mean that will be a discussion that's open to maybe he could switch between uh, the posi- both positions if needed but if you just look what he's achieved I remember going to cover a game for the under 21s with um, Freddie Lundberg was in charge at the time and I managed to have a quick chat with him about players coming through uh, and who he thought would be the player that would make the step through into um, the first team eventually and would be a huge hit. And uh, Macri Saka was the one that was talked about. Um, so, I mean, in terms of what he's done at, uh, at left back, it's absolutely in- incredible. Um, he's adapted um, and what I think it gives him what I love what he's doing is he's giving him freedom to move forward which all fullbacks get now but he's moving forward and coming onto the ball and he's almost not being marked so he's so dangerous when he's got uh, in, in possession of uh, of the ball and his quality um, is of some of his crosses that he's put in for some of the goals has been absolutely sensational. So there's no doubt in my mind if if Arsenal wanted to and Mikel Arteta wanted to keep him in that position and, and work with him, then he's going to become stronger and stronger because you know defensively he's going to improve uh, and you just keep working on your game going forward. So he's, he, to me, he's been an absolute sensation in, in that position. Absolutely. And I think you're right to, to mention Mikel Arteta there because as well, I think what he's done is he's created an environment in which Saka can flourish in the way that he sets the team up, in the way that Granite Xhaka pulls out to the left, in the way Aubameyang cuts inside. He almost creates that space for him, doesn't he, to flourish. And to, to do the things that he's good at without necessarily being completely exposed defensively. And I think in recent seasons, Arsenal have had that problem where they haven't been able to find the balance between fullbacks getting forward and defending effectively. So I think that's something that Mikel Arteta deserves praise for. Oh, yes, certainly. I mean, um, and also what, uh, you know, playing in that position now, if you're young and you're very, very fit, the one thing you want to have as well is pace. And he's got an abundance of pace to, you know, even if he makes a slight mistake defensively, he can cover, he can even, you know, he what he should be working on now is that showing uh, the opposition players who, particularly when it's one against one at times, showing them where he wants them to go or where Arteta wants that the team to be pushed into. You know, when, just quickly when I was playing with George Graham, we wanted to show inside all the time. And with the pace that he's got, you know, he can he can change his position to to make dictate to players where he actually wants them to go, rather than being dictated against when you're um, defending. So, you know, he's there's a lot of positives we're seeing. There's still a lot of developments to um, to, to to come. But as as I just said to you, right, you know, he's done a fantastic job. He's just been pushed into that position really, and he's had to get on with it. 
and uh, you know he's been he's been an absolute uh, sensation and someone that could if he was to play in that position regularly will get better uh, and better and that's a, that's an exciting thought isn't it <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. The the potential is incredible, and that's I think what Arsenal uh, supporters are so excited about because we've seen glimpses of it. And and you've got to take into account that again, it's not a position he's grown up playing yet. He's taken to it like a duck to water, and for that, um, you know, he, he deserves incredible praise. Um, Nigel, I wanted to get your thoughts on uh, on Pierre Emerick Aubameyang. Um, of course, Arsenal's leading goal scorer. He's become a real talisman of late. Um, somebody that we almost rely on uh, to, you know, to provide goals, and and I think probably we rely on a bit too heavily. There's a lot of talk of him leaving. Um, it, it's not easy, though, is it, to replace someone that you're going to get 20, 25 goals off of guaranteed? So should Arsenal be trying to do their utmost to keep him, even if the contract is going to run down? Uh, yes, they should. I mean. You know, he's a goal scorer. You money to buy a goal scorer and be successful at your club because there's still always that little bit of doubt. Even if someone's been successful at one club, you bring them into, let's say, a different league. Will they settle? Do they fit into the team that you're trying to build? Uh, and we know we've got somebody that will get as a huge amount of goals. So um, the jig's always quite simple for me the first thing you ask is does the player want to stay um, and if he does then you have to try and provide him with the contract that is going to make him stay and I would also say that maybe that um, one other thing is is where does he see the club going listen at the end of all that if the player wants to leave then there is nothing that the club can do to make him stay you know players have so much power now they're so wealthy and if they're going to leave uh, and we've seen with what's happened before in the past with Arsenal they've lost a huge amount of money by letting trying to persuade players and let their contracts run to the very very end and get nothing for them um, it's, it's quite simple for me then potentially they may have to be sold and that's quite a hard thought for me to think about that you would be losing your your top goal scorer and then you've got to start all over again so yes they've got to do everything they can uh, hopefully you know he loves the way that the club is uh, being run now under Mikel Arteta he feels that maybe we've got a chance of building and will achieve something in, in the future or does he feel that you know we're still still a good way away and in his period uh, and the age that he is then he needs to look for something different and it's hard to talk about that um, when you've got such a great player at, at your football club but I think those you know you just got to look the player in the eye and I think the manager and the board will know when, when he answers the question is straight away do you want to stay yeah um, and that's the first question you you've got to ask and Right, if the answer is yes, then we'll do everything we can to provide you with a contract that you think you are worth within within the, the club's limitations. But if there's a hesitation there, then uh, you probably know that uh, the player's having thoughts that maybe he should be moving on and uh, and then it becomes very, very difficult for the supporters because they're the, they're the, play, they're the ones that, that really lose out in all this. They're going to they're gonna lose... A fantastic goal scorer and we're going to have to rebuild our team again absolutely and I think you're right it, it's it, what's happened in the past has almost conditioned Arsenal supporters to panic at this point um, when a player gets to this point in their contract and they are obviously a standout player and we hope that you know he will stay and, and as you said there is no guarantee that even if you go and spend 60-70 million on another centre forward that he's going to provide what Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang is providing so you're absolutely right it's better in my opinion to stick with what you know and if you need to it ex not not exceed the limitations obviously because you can't but if you really need to push the boundary to keep him i personally think it's worth it uh, just finally nigel i just want to get your thoughts on Mikel arteta so far if you had to rate his tenure so far out of 10 what, what, what's the score you're giving him uh, i think i'd be seven and a half to eight i think he's doing a i think he's doing a, a great job he's working with 
players that were already at the club. I like what he's doing or trying to do discipline wise. I mean, you know, I'm not on the inside, but I'm only reading. You know, if if he's not happy with what a player's doing, maybe in training or outside of training, he's not afraid to leave them out for a game warn them that it's about the club it's about the team it's not about an individual um, but I like the more importantly also like the togetherness that I'm seeing on the pitch listen it's not perfect some of the games haven't been great but there is a glimmer of light coming through that he's got some organisation he's got his beliefs and the team are really believing in what they are trying to achieve and that's the most important thing for me uh, and hopefully, as I say, we can get back to playing uh, and then we can look at the end of this season and the transfers that potentially we might have just to try and tweak it a bit again for, for next season. Um, then I'm, I'm, I'm really positive about what we can try and achieve going forward. So I think it's, I think it's going to be a slow process but hopefully a, an exciting process for, particularly for the supporters who have been a bit disillusioned in the last three or four seasons that we're now looking to move in a, in a new direction, in the right direction for me and uh, try and get back first of all into that top four and back in Champions League and then try, try to start challenging for, for, for trophies again. And obviously the, the Premier League is the, is the big one for me. Um, but I think that's a little way off. But as long as I see us moving forward, then um, you know I, I really think we're in, we're in for a, an exciting time. Absolutely, couldn't agree more, Nigel. Thank you so much, mate. Apologies for taking a little bit more of your time than scheduled, but you've been great. It's been great to hear some of your stories and hear your thoughts on, of course, uh, some of the modern day issues at Arsenal. So really thankful, and hopefully we can speak to you again in the near future. No, no problems. Anytime you wish to, it's not a problem. Thank you very much, Nigel. All the best. Cheers. Thanks very much. That brings us to the end of another edition of Arsenal Gold. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, leave us a review, uh, leave us your thoughts in the comments as well. You know the drill by now. Uh, follow us on Twitter at Chronicles underscore AFC and we'll be back very, very soon with another edition. We'll be bringing you another episode on Wednesday. It'll be out Wednesday evening featuring another former Arsenal player. So, uh, I hope you're looking forward to that as much as I am. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Until then, take care. Ciao.